I was holding back tears as I sat to write this story two days ago. I don't know why I was feeling so emotional. All I know was that I was physically exhausted. Four days from today, on November 1st, I will face a 25% increase in the rent of my studio. And this follows a previous 25% rent increase last year. Being forced to organize a move of my studio contents in the midst of regular commitments and responsibilities, struggling to maintain a space in which to work is a strain on my body and psyche. I am reminded of the author Dionne Brand and her 1983 book of poems titled Winter Epigrams, where she wrote, the superintendent dug up the plants again. Each June, she plants them. Each September, she digs them up, just as they are blooming. This business of dying so often and so soon is getting to me. Yesterday, I packed a series of photos I made when I was 28 years old. They are titled, Evicted Studios at Nine Hannah Avenue, November 1999. Here are some installation shots of the time I showed these photos a decade after they were made at the Darling Foundry in Montreal. And here's a close-up of one of the photographs. Here are the photographs packed in a crate that I moved to a storage facility in Etobicoke yesterday. Today we speak of Toronto's cultural diversity Half of this city's population was born outside of Canada. This is a city largely made by people who have packed and moved. My mom, dad, three brothers, and me are counted among such people. In March last year, curator Adam Lauder invited me to participate in an exhibition titled Futurisms that he was organizing at the Macintosh Gallery at Western University. He thought of me, he said, due to my engagement with London regionalism, an artistic discourse that is dear to my heart. As a response to Adam's invitation, I embarked on a project to visit every place I had lived in since my family moved from Lima to Toronto in 1981. Here is a photograph of my mom and me visiting our apartment building at 180 Markham Road in Scarborough, our first home in Toronto. Neither of us had been there in more than 35 years. She told me, full of emotion, that she used to watch my brothers and me from one of the balconies as we walked each day to our first school in Canada. In grade five, I had to devise a way to let my teachers know I spoke no English. I decided during the recess break one day that I would yell out, careful, in Spanish, to the monitor teacher if the ball got close to her. So I waited and waited, hoping the ball was going to uh, go near her. And I yelled, cuidado, cuidado. This did the trick. And my brothers and I got pulled from our classes to spend the rest of the year with another boy from Chile and uh, a teacher that they especially dedicated uh, for us in the library. This impromptu ESL class was a successful exercise in improvisation on the school's part. I owe it my ability to speak to you today. At each place I visited for this project, I took a few color samples of the doorway, building walls, and nearby objects. Back in the studio, I selected 35 of these colors and approximated them as carefully as possible in oil paints. So here are the paints, and here are some of the panels that I applied them to in my studio. Here's the final work, titled Habitat, for example, 
on exhibition in London, Ontario. London is a special place to me because of Greg Curnow. This work is indebted to what I have learned from him and his connection to the city where he lived and worked. This is Curnow's work titled 24 Hourly Notes, 14 to 15 December, 1966. He made it by stenciling one panel each hour, letter by letter, during a 24 hour cycle. I'll read the text in three of these panels. 5 p.m., late starting, the first A slipped. This white ink is slippery, GH. 6 p.m. At 25 after 5, I switched to CKLW. It's dark out and the chimney has gradually become invisible. It's DA talking to Jamie on the phone, going over the difficulty of working in this fucking city. 7 p.m. The phone rings. I remember Owen drooling on the phone at 5.3. I remember the first meeting that I had with Tyrone and Candace last summer. I showed them my monochrome panels for London and mentioned Greg Perno. I also recall Candace saying, I love Perno, and began to feel very connected to her. She told me that among indigenous communities, people find Perno's work very useful, in particular his last book titled Deeds, Nations which was published posthumously by his friends in 1996. As Judith Roger notes, Deeds Nations is an alphabetical listing of over 1,000 First Nations individuals who lived in southwestern Ontario between 1750 and 1850. As archaeologist Neil Ferris explained, until Greg Curnow's monumental effort to track down follow up and piece together the personal biographies and family histories of the native people signing the southwestern Ontario land surrenders of the 18th and 19th centuries, little had been done to make sense of who most of these signatories were or their roles in local or regional communities. And Judith Rogers continues, Kerno had extended his notion of regionalism from his backyard and the here and now to what had happened in his region for thousands of years. As he wrote, I have felt the power of many details adding up to an understanding of the ground I am standing on. It is an understanding that is new to me. Here is a piece of ground I photographed at St. Jamestown on July 2nd this past summer. And here's another photograph from last summer, which I took at Regent's Park. Wanda Nanabush, curator of indigenous art at the AGO, organized an exhibition titled Toronto, Tributes and Tributaries, 1971 to 1989, where she observed, this city tends to bury things, histories, neighborhoods, waterways. I understand Regent Park as a place that has been buried many times over. In the 1680s, the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy pushed back the Haudenosaunee from here to the south side of Lake Ontario. By the time the 20th century rolled around, Irish settlers established Cabbage Town right here in, in the place uh, depicted in the photograph, burying in some ways the indigenous presence there. In the 1940s, these Irish people were deemed a nuisance by city officials. Following modernist urban planning principles of urban renewal and slum clearance, their neighborhood was bulldozed to the ground to make way for Regent Park, which eventually became a home for working class immigrants of color. Then in 2003, city council decided this community had itself become a nuisance. Council approved the Regent Park Revitalization Plan as a public-private partnership between community, Toronto Community Housing and Daniels Corporation to develop existing social housing buildings 
into new mixed income buildings that include for-profit market units. Here on the left is Peter Dickinson's Mezzanette Towers, completed in 1958 and an award-winning part of Regent Park. Here it is being demolished. These are people's homes. And here is another piece of ground I photographed at the Leslie Spit on July 17 last year. Leslie Spit is a geography entirely made of this city's demolished buildings. What I love about this is how somebody, a group of people, had rearranged this material of dispossession. They adopted this urban detritus of a running, of a city running on a business of dying so often and so soon in order to construct for themselves a gathering spot at the water. This story is some of, some of the many details adding up to an understanding of the ground that I am standing on. And this is what I see. Thanks.